morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are. Uh, and welcome to this latest webinar in our series of the work of Edwin Lutyens. Um, in this case, it's the, a particular feature of the work that he carried out in the wake of World War I. Uh, the war ended on Armistice Day, the 11th of November, 1918, just over 102 years ago. Sorry, we missed the date. Um, the war left some two, 10 million people, human beings dead and a sea of mud and destruction across Europe. And our panelists today will discuss the part which Sir Edwin played in bringing order out of this chaos and in commemorating the dead. And in particular, how his instincts and his subtle geometry created the Cenotaph in London, Whitehall, which became and remains the focus for the UK nation's commemoration of those who died in the war. There was, by the way, an article in the Sunday Telegraph about this yesterday by Edwin Lutchins' granddaughter, Candy. Some of you may have seen that or could pick up on it uh, on the web. Our panelists today, we're very pleased to welcome. Um, there are two. They are both trustees of the Lutchins Trust. One is Jane Ridley and the other is Clive Aslett. And our moderator in America is um, Robin Prater uh, in Atlanta, Georgia. Jane Ridley um, is a great granddaughter of Edwin Lutyens. She's a historian, biographer, broadcaster, and professor of modern history at the University of Buckingham. Um, she's written several famous biographies. One was of Edwin Lutyens himself, which won her the Duff Krupa Prize a few years ago, but also uh, biographies of King Edward VII, Queen Victoria, and she's currently working on one of Queen Mary sorry, of King George V and Queen Mary. Clive Aslett um, is an architectural historian, extremely well known as a writer. And uh, for many years he was working for and became editor of Country Life magazine, which of course was very influential in launching the career of Edwin Lutyens before I have to say uh, Clive's day. <laughs> He's also, since recently, the co-proprietor of a publishing house called Triglyph Books, whose latest publication is Old Homes, New Life, The Resurgence of the British Country House. It's a lovely book. Um, Robin is, as I mentioned before, is the uh, executive director of the Lutyens Trust America, and um, she will be involved in the conversation from the point of view of um, questions arising from the American audience. And um, at the end of the presentation, um, or the two things I should say, the first is that the session is being recorded and will appear on both on the Lutkin Trust and Lutkin Trust America websites in about a week's time, and will also be put on YouTube then so that you can refer back to it in those three places in future. Second is that there's a, a button at the bottom of your screens for questions and answers, Q&A. Please use the tab to ask any questions and these will be fielded and fed to the panelists at the end. So um, the presentation will last about 40 minutes and I'd like to hand over now to Jane and Clive. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin. Martin, thank you so much. I'm, I'm going to attempt to screen share now. Let me just, there we are. I hope that's, I hope that's worked. Um, I think that I, I, I will begin this, if I may, with just uh, 10 or 15 minutes of uh, scene setting to say something about the First World War very briefly and, and particularly its impact on the British people and to talk about the ways that it was remembered through monuments which really show how extraordinary Lutyens' imagination in creating the Cenotaph was, because it's significantly different from other approaches, although it was the national memorial, and it was really extraordinary because although very abstract, it was taken to the heart of the nation really immediately. Here it is, it um, stands on Whitehall. Um, I'll just say something about the First World War, because uh, when I talk to American friends, they don't uh, always really realise what a complete trauma and catastrophe it was really for the whole of Europe and um, 
uh, Britain amongst that. Uh, Britain, the Britain's losses weren't the greatest, but we lost 900,000 people, young men who were uh, killed. Uh, through the British Empire, the figure was about 1.1 million or, or, or more than that. So it was an enormous loss and a huge number of people uh, that, that's just the number of the people who were killed. There are many more who were coming back without limbs or without eyes, or uh, they had been gassed and they were blind. And this was a very, very uh, common sight. Nobody, of course, expected this uh, when the war started in 1914. It started um, uh, in, in September, I think, or was it the end of August? But people thought it was going to be over by Christmas. And they were absolutely astonished that the um, if you were British, that the uh, British army hadn't, although it was tiny, this force that we sent originally, um, hadn't succeeded in uh, finishing this off. But um, it went on and on and on and uh, got into static trench warfare and all the um, armaments of defence were very, very effective and nobody knew how to break through. So this bludgeoning of both sides went on for um four years and it was really terrible in every possible way and the whole country was involved and everybody had sons or cousins or um, brothers who were fighting at the front and at a very early point in the war in 1915 there was what can only really now be related to Princess Diana's death there was a kind of Diana moment and people started putting out candles and um, uh, extemporized shrines at crossroads and so on, really as a um, symbol of their anxiety and um, uh, uh, trying to propitiate the gods uh, almost. But the subject of remembrance too came up very, very quickly, but there were different um, attitudes to how this should be done. I thought I'd just show you this. This is the roll of honour from a tiny little village in Lincolnshire. But if you look at the bottom half of the page, you'll see all those people called Beachy. And they all came from one family, a vicar who had seven sons, of whom five were killed in the war. So that, I just show that to illustrate the scale of the um, catastrophe that people were facing. And, and Clive, isn't it true that, that sometimes villages would all, the men would all volunteer together, they all played on a football team together or the palace yes. regiments? Yes, as uh, time went on, um, the little force we sent over to begin with was all very, very um, professional. But as time went on, they needed more and more men. So they recruited uh, really everybody and you couldn't get out of it. But um, there was a view before the Battle of the Somme that it was a good thing for people to fight in units where they knew each other. And so there were things called PALS battalions and they were, um, as uh, Robin said, football teams or factories or uh, particular uh, uh, towns groups of people who um, who knew each other. And of course, the devastation when whole units got obliterated uh, during the Battle of the Somme was of course then immense because um, uh, not only whole families lost everybody, but, uh, but, but whole communities were absolutely uh, decimated. Uh, so it caused great, great uh, trauma. And after the war, or indeed before the war had ended, there was a move to put up um, memorials. Uh, the British people were not outwardly very demonstrative by nature, but this was something that they all wanted to do to show their joint grief. And we now have an enormous number because everybody did this. Um, factories, railway stations, colleges, churches, schools, everybody um, wanted to remember the people whom they'd lost. It, it, was, it was spontaneous. These weren't organized by the government. They were organized by little committees. And we've got about 100,000 in the country. And um, these slides just show people walking past uh, war memorials. They happen to be near where I live in London. Um, and they're just part of the background of our lives. People don't really look at them even. Um, the one on the left um, is a Calvary, a, a figure of Christ 
on the cross outside a church and the one on the right is in Victoria Station. But people don't really look at them. They're very, very common. Although they still play a very important role um, on November the 11th every year, which is our Remembrance Day. But these monuments took all um, sorts of kinds, uh, sorts of forms. I'm just trying to get rid of, maybe that will go away by itself, do you think? Um, uh, and here, uh, as you can see, are um, two sculptures. Uh, the one on the right, if you can see it, is very moving because it's in um, a very remote part of Scotland, just on the crossing to Skye. As it happens, it was designed by uh, Robert Lorimer. Uh, the, the sculpture was called uh, Dukas, and I show this because the it was paid for by the lady um, of the manor, as it were, up there, and she said to the local people, your, your, your fishing community, the pier is falling down, would you like me to pay for a new pier in memory of the people who've died, or would you like a monument? And they all said, no, we'd like a monument. People's lives were very, very, very tough. Uh, at the time of the First World War, particularly in the countryside, people were very poor. But um, there was a strong feeling, at least in this community, that they wanted a monument. So uh, the cenotaph was expressing something that was a common uh, feeling in the country. And uh, on the left, there's a sculpture showing a young soldier in Cambridge. It happens to be by uh, a sculptor who was actually really an instructor in physical education, but he was quite a good sculptor too. Anyway, it shows him He's, he's walking past the end of the road that leads to the station, and he's come back, he's got flowers on his helmet. So he's come back and he's glancing back at the station, wondering what's happened to all his comrades who aren't so lucky. So, you know, Lutchens could have thought of something figurative like this. Um, and I show this one, this is the memorial to the machine gun corps on Hyde Park, and as you can see, it's a uh, idealized uh, uh, sort of a Greek statue of, of David holding um, a sword. And I draw attention to it particularly because this was the, um, well, this was the mood of this particular monument. But if you look at the bottom left-hand side, you see a quotation from the Bible. And this is the machine gun corps. And they say, Saul hath slain his thousands, but David, his tens of thousands. <laughs> and of course, to us, that's rather a difficult um, idea to accept really, because it's saying that this is a very, very good thing that these machine guns could, that could, could shoot for, uh, they had a range of two miles and, and they could fire very, very rapidly and, and kill, they killed so many people. This is being celebrated on this monument, but this is not the idea of the cenotaph. Um, and I show this, this is a slightly uh, uh, poor one for um, a talk to people who admire Lutchens because this is one that got away. This is the Royal Artillery Memorial. Lutchens designed over 130 war memorials, but um, he, he, he put in for this one, but he didn't get it. But nevertheless, um, it's a masterpiece. It's by Charles Sergeant Jagger. Um, Jagger is called Sergeant Jagger, not because he was a sergeant, but because he's related to uh, John Singer Sergeant. Um, but he did fight in the war himself and he fought in the Worcestershire Regiment. So he really, really knew, unlike a lot of people who hadn't been to the front, how absolutely awful it was. And this monument uh, to the artillery has a howitzer at the top, but I don't know whether you can see these, this freeze. It's, it's again um, in, in a heroic uh, um, Greek, style really like the Elgin marbles but uh, actually if you look at the detail it's very harrowing and he uh, made these monumental figures they're monumental figures who are dressed exactly as they would have been when they were fighting on the front it was thought to be very um, bold and rather shocking but he, he um, wanted to project ideal figures but actually also to show how uh, something of how absolutely appalling it had been and he had experience of it. Again, that's not um, Lutchens' approach. This was thought to be um, uh, tremendously shocking, if not distasteful. He actually showed um, a soldier who had fallen and he's, he's lying under his cape. Um, that caused a lot of controversy amongst um, the public who wanted to see something rather more 
uplifting. Well, uh, there was another point of view, and uh, Lutchins was asked to respond to it here at Jura's Cross. Um, life was very tough for people, as I say, particularly in villages. Villages were depopulating, and a lot of villages didn't actually want a monument at all. They wanted something which was practical, and um, a village hall like this, or a memorial hall, there are quite a lot of them in the um, English countryside, offered somewhere where the community could get together and actually do something sensible. Um, they, uh, it would build the community. And some villagers thought, well, this is actually what the young men who died would have wanted. They would have wanted something practical. So there are a whole range of different approaches. None of these are what um, Lutchens chose for the cenotaph. Uh, I show this because this is um, a, a monument that commemorates Indian soldiers. At an early point in the war, extraordinary enough, the Royal Pavilion in Brighton, which was built by the Prince Regent in the very early 19th century, actually in an Indian style, but in a rather fabulous Indian style, was turned into a hospital. And some Indian soldiers were brought there, they died, their bodies were then cremated. And later, this architect, Henriquez, who was um, who worked in India, designed this Chattery memorial, which I think a, I think a Chattery is a memorial to um, or, or, or uh, commemorates a place where people have been, their bodies have been burned. And um, it reminds us that Lutchens himself had a very strong opinion because the first, before the cenotaph was uh, created, uh, Lord Curzon, who was responsible for the committee, had suggested there would be a great big cross, a huge cross. And Lutchens didn't want that because he was very aware that soldiers from all around the empire had fought and were being commemorated in not only this national memorial, but this memorial at the heart of the empire. And they hadn't all been Christians. Some had been Hindus, some had been Sikhs, some had been Muslims, some were atheists, some were Jews. And Lutchens was very aware that he wanted to find a monument which would remember them all. Indeed, in India, he designed um, the arch in Delhi. And if you look at the sides of the arch, you can see a cenotaph in silhouette. It's, it's rather, I've just been shown that just before this lecture, I didn't realize, but um, it's rather wonderful. Uh, lettering, this was another approach. Um, Eric Gill was a very famous member of the arts and crafts movement. He had his own uh, quasi-religious communities, a bit weird, but um, one of them was in Ditchling. And when Ditchling needed a war memorial, um, he designed this abstract one with just the letter, with just the names really of the uh, fallen in, in, this, in this beautiful, beautiful lettering that he had been designing and encouraging. And his brother, Macdonald Gill, worked with Lutchens and the Imperial War Graves Committee on the lettering of all the war cemeteries in France and Flanders. Actually, um, I don't think he lettered the cenotaph, which was a bit earlier, and actually his lettering is better. Um, this was the most common form of all these 100,000 war memorials, a cross of some kind. It, um, it was a Christian symbolism, but it had a direct relationship to suffering and sacrifice, which spoke to people. But each community chose a different thing, and, and there were tremendous arguments sometimes as to what form it should take. Uh, I'd just like to mention um, some of the war memorials that, uh, or one war memorial that Lutchens created for friends of his, the Horner family at Mel's, Mel's Manor. He used to go there before the First World War. And when he walked around the village with Lady Horner, looking for the place to put the village war memorial, he wrote to his wife, Lady Emily, and said, all their young men are dead. And it was uh, um, a comment which uh, spoke to the suffering of so many villages. But he also designed um, memorials for two young officers. This is Edward Horner on the left. He was the last of the Horner family, this, this, um, uh, this wonderful young man. And he is shown on a memorial designed by Lutchens um, and uh, Munnings, the horse painter, was prevailed upon to 
make the sculpture. And I presume the concept was um, Lutchens is the officers in the First World War rode horses, but this is an immediate speaks immediately to the idea of Christian chivalry. And chivalry was one thing that everybody, uh, every young man who went to a public school would have been brought up uh, to to be very conscious of. It was the spirit of the games field and um, the spirit of um, it absolutely went through and through these great public schools that uh, they went to. But there was another uh, ideal that they subscribed to, and that was the classics and the stoicism of the classics and the sense that you had to take what life threw at you. You took it on the chin and with a stiff upper lip. Um, this is a memorial to Edward Horner's um, uh, brother-in-law, Raymond Asquith. He, the prime minister at the beginning of the First World War was H.H. H. Asquith, and this was his son. And it shows that everybody was affected. The prime minister, everybody, everybody um, suffered this loss um, equally. But the memorial that Lutchen suggested for him is carved into the very stones of the church. And it's in Latin. It's a Latin um, inscription, which is carved by Eric Gill. And um, all there is, is this bronze wreath above it. So I think for me, those are two uh, very moving um, monuments that uh, Lutchen's designed for a private family. But for the cenotaph, he did something which was different again. But before, just before I hand over to Jane, um, I'd like to reflect on something that uh, Lutchens wrote to Lady Emily when he visited the front in 1917. So the year, well, the year actually that um, poor Edward Horner was killed. But um, this was the year before the end of the war. And he went there and he was horrified by what he saw. And he wrote to his wife, because I presume he was there to advise on some sort of monument. And he wrote to his wife, what humanity can endure, suffer, is beyond belief. The only monument can be one in which the endeavor is sincere to make such a monument permanent, a solid ball of bronze. So he immediately thought, um, not in terms of sculpture or anything that was figurative or representational but for him the most profound monument to this terrible agony that he saw this awful mud and suffering and horror of the trenches was something that was completely abstract a sphere of bronze jane um i'm now going to hand over to you i think well can i thank you that was um not incredibly interesting. Um, and I need to focus a little bit more um, on the cenotaph itself. And um, here is the cenotaph as it is today. And um, I think the, the, the first thing to say about it is really, you know, what does the, what does the word cenotaph mean? I think that the story behind uh, the um, naming of the cenotaph comes um, from Lachin's encounter with um, Lloyd George, who was the prime minister. Um, we are now in 1919, a year after the, almost a year after the end of the war. Um, and in July 1919, uh, the, uh, the, the peace treaty was signed in France, the, the, the Versailles settlement. Um, and um, uh, Lloyd George suddenly realized that the French were having a procession and a sort of celebratory um, march through Paris and that the British hadn't arranged any celebrations at all and they mustn't be left behind because this would seem um, that they didn't approve of the treaty. So um, Lloyd George in a sort of state of panic uh, goes off to um, Edwin Lutyens uh, and um, asks him to design a memorial and there were other memorials designed by other people I think in the celebration as well. Um, Lloyd George, Lutchin said, what do you want? What sort of um, memorial? And Lloyd George says to Lutchins, uh, well, we need a cattle falc, a, a cattle falc. And um, uh, uh, Lutchin, and a cattle falc is a sort of base um, of, a, of, 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 of a, um, a, a memorial bearing something on top of it. Um, and Lutchin said, no, I don't want to do that. I want to do a cenotaph. 
Um, and I'm not sure that Lloyd George knew what a cenotaph was, but basically um, a cenotaph is an empty tomb. And you can see at the top of the cenotaph there is indeed um, an empty tomb. Um, we don't really know where Latchin's got um, the idea for a cenotaph, but most people um, suggest that it goes right back 25 years to when he was a much younger man in the garden of um, Gertrude Jekyll. But I'll come on to that slide in a minute. Could we have the next slide? Sorry, I'm forgetting about my slides. Of course, the um, next slide. young men, their bodies couldn't be brought back, could they, Jane? No, um, no, they couldn't. Uh, <laughs> Um, so, sorry, um, on that point that Clive's just made, um, I think the one of the, why the idea of an empty tomb was so significant and why it um, uh, struck such a, such a chord with the British public at this time um, was that it was forbidden um, during the First World War uh, to bring the bodies of dead soldiers back to Britain to be um, buried. Um, and this in some ways seems rather sort of cruel and unthinking, but in other ways it was extraordinarily sort of um, far-sighted and forward-looking. Um, and, and, and that is the idea that, you know, if, if it was allowed to bring bodies back, only rich people would have been able to afford it and the poor would have left their fallen um, in France. Um, instead, there's this idea of universal universality of sacrifice. It doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor. The point is that you've given your life um, for your country. So the idea of an empty tomb um, was a, a brilliant kind of metaphor that um, Latchin's evolved on the cenotaph uh, for this kind of, for, for the grief that all the people, um, all the people who've been bereaved, um, all the people who've lost their sons or their fathers or their brothers or their husbands in this war, um, they're able to sort of identify with the empty tomb. And it provides the kind of closure which they couldn't get um, because there were no, um, um, funerals that they could attend um, of the people they'd lost. Um, so looking at Latchin's here, um, this, this was, this, here's a photograph of Latchin's at the time of the um, designing of the cenotaph when he's 50, at sort of at the peak of his career um, and um, just about um, to become incredibly famous as a result of the um, design of the cenotaph. Um, and this is a very, there are very, very few photographs of Latchin's, but this is one of the, one of the only ones that we have. Um, and you do get um, the impression of this rather sort of impish character with these round glasses. And as he got older, the glasses got bigger and bigger um, and he became more and more owlish. Um, you have to, you can, you can imagine from this um, image that Latchin's was a man um, who um, made a great deal of a great many puns, a great many jokes. <laughs> Um, so, um, uh, if, if Lachins, um, Lach, as, as, as Clive has told us, um, Lachins did visit um, the front, um, and when he went there, he would have seen, if we look at the next slide, um, this sort of, this, this is a kind of typical image um, from uh, the war in, 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 in France, in northern France, um, the chaos, um, the, the, the tragedy, the filth, the squalor. Um, there's sort of, you know, rats, um, bits of bodies. Um, it, it was an absolutely traumatic scene. And um, Latchin's, as, as Clive rightly said, was completely horrified by it, the dirt and the filth. If we could have another slide, please. Clive, thank you. Um, and this is um, a, a slide from a, a photograph from a much, um, obviously, much, I think it's an aerial photograph, uh, but you can see from this, which is a photograph of the Ypres, um, the Great Battle of Ypres, the Ypres salient, um, just how the, the entire countryside um, of Belgium and northern France um, was completely sort of mucked up and um, uh, destroyed uh, by the battlefield. Um, if we move on again. And compare this uh, to what we've just looked at. Um, we've looked um, at, um, at the battlefield as it was, the mud and the blood and the bodies. Um, this is what happened um, when the um, architects of the Im Imperial War Commission um, uh, produced um, one of the most famous graves, gra um, uh, burial grounds of the First World War. Um, this is the Etat, 
um, burial ground. And it's, this was built just slightly after the cenotaph in about 1922. Um, and um, it is actually um, a, a, a fascinating um, uh, slide and it's a fascinating image. Uh, you can see um, the graves, each soldier, it doesn't matter what his rank, each soldier um, has um, a headstone with his name on. All the headstones stand as they did not on the battlefield. They stand to attention. They're all facing east uh, towards the sun or towards the enemy, whichever way you like it to be. Um, and they're there um, in this incredibly sort of green garden um, uh, environment um, um, enclosed by um, the, the, the two pavilions on the right. Um, and if you look at the right hand pavilion, with the flags, the stone flags around it, um, you can see a structure which is in fact um, very similar to the structure that, thank you Claire, that we're going to look at um, in a minute, um, which is the cenotaph itself. Um, and so um, we can see also, if you look at the cross of sacrifice, which Herbert Baker designed, Lachlan is his great rival at the back of the um, etat, uh, graveyard, um, where you've got a sword stuck into stone, and the sword, fall, you know, held down with its point downwards as an indication of, 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 of you know, peace and surrendering fighting. Um, that cross of sacrifice is aligned at the front with a, 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 an image, a, 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 a thing rather like a, an altar, it is an altar, um, which was called the Great War Stone, and that was designed by Lutyens. And here we have um, another um, great wall stain, which was, it was reproduced in most of Latchins's um, uh, bigger um, uh, graveyards in, in France. Um, and there um, with the inscription um, on the um, great wall stain, you can see is their name liveth forevermore. Um, and that inscription actually came from the Bible, from the book of Ecclesiasticus, um, but it was chosen by one of the great sort of literary figures and the great people who sort of articulated so much about the First World War, um, which was Kipling, who was on the sort of committee um, for the war graves um, with Lutyens and Baker and um, several others. Um, so we'll see that name again. And also just coming back to the point that Clive made about the about Lutyens having this vision when he went to the trenches of, 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 of you know, this great ball of, 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 of solid brass. He didn't get that. Um, he didn't build that. Um, but there are echoes of that in the Great Wall Stone, because in the Great Wall Stone, the horizontals are all um, uh, arcs of a circle, which is 900 feet um, below the ground. Um, so there are hints of a circle, a huge circle, but it's a, it's a, you know, it's a geometrical circle. Um, it's, it's, it's an abstract circle. And all we're left with of the circle is this tiny arc, um, chunk of the arc. Um, in, in the shape of the Great Wall Stain. Um, so let's, and, and there again is another um, example of the Great Wall Stain, very, very simple um, and yet incredibly sort of moving. And isn't Go it on. also referred to as the Stone of Remembrance? Yes, either. Latchians called it the Great Wall, Wall Stain, but it's certainly the same thing. And it is basically an altar. And here is um, what is thought to be the, um, the inspiration uh, for the word cenotaph. Um, this is the garden of G Gertrude Jekyll, Latchins' um, patron friend, the woman who discovered his genius really um, as a very young man and for whom he built, um, or either with whom or for whom he built a great many of his early houses. Um, and um, the, the, what, this is a sort of rather undistinguished um, stone bench um, in um, Gertrude Jekyll's garden. And um, somebody went up to that and, 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 and you know, they're all looking at this stone bench. Somebody said, well, it's quite plain what this be be bench is. It is um, the um, cenotaph to Sigismunda. Um, Lachins was thunderstruck because he'd never heard of a cenotaph or of Sig Sigismunda. I don't think many of us have heard of Sigismunda even today. I think she was a, 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 a woman um, in the Renaissance whose who, who's, who's, um, husband was murdered in a nasty way. But, um, uh, but the point is that this was Latchin's introduction, um, assimilation of that word cenotaph to mean um, an empty tomb, which he carries on with the, with the cenotaph itself. Now, Lloyd George, as I said earlier, 
um, our slatchings at great speed um, to um, design, you know, almost instantly, um, a, um, a monument for this um, hastily improvised war procession, peace procession, sorry, um, in um, 1919. Um, and what is extraordinary is just how quickly uh, the design is evolved by Latchins. Um, I mean, it's really a matter of hours. He sees Lloyd George on, uh, in the afternoon, um, and then he goes out and he has dinner um, with his great friend, Lady Sackville. Um, and at dinner, he um, scribbles, as you can see with um, these, this, he makes these sketches, scribbling with um, colored pen pencils. Um, and already we have um, a clear sense of the um, cenotaph design. Um, and, and so these, these, the, all these images and all these sort of um, design pieces, they were all, all, all clearly already in his head. He was already thinking about it and it came out very easily and very quickly within six hours, I think. Um, these are some more um, drawings made by his office probably for the actual um, temporary cenotaph. And the cenotaph, obviously, it couldn't be that he made for the victory procession in two weeks or whatever it was. It couldn't have been um, made of stone. There just wasn't time. So the, the um, temporary cenotaph was improvised uh, and it was made um, from, um, uh, uh, from, from, from wood um, and plaster. Um, and you can see that here. So should we, we can see, I think, a photograph of it next. Jane, could I just, um, I, I just this afternoon uh, discovered this um, uh, account that uh, Lutyens had, um, he, he, he wrote, a, he wrote um, a journal of remembrance, which is in the Imperial War Museum in London. And he, he describes um, uh, how, how the temporary cenotaph immediately seemed to express and seemed to be a focus for um, the nation's grief. And um, if I could just interrupt for a moment and, and uh, read it out. Time passed and the plain fact emerged and grew stronger every hour that the cenotaph was what the people wanted and that they wanted to have the wood and plaster original replaced by an identical memorial in lasting stone. It was a mass feeling too deep to express itself more fitly than by piles of ever fresh flowers, which loving hands placed on the cenotaph day by day, because it was it was like um, the expression of grief when Princess Diana died. Uh, people piled heaps and heaps of flowers around it. Thus, it was decided by the human sentiment of millions that the cenotaph should be as it is now. And speaking as the designer. I would wish for no greater honour, no more complete and lasting satisfaction. So it was just to, to say that it was a popular upwelling of um, grief and recognition that this was such an appropriate form for the National Memorial. Uh, yes, absolutely. Sorry to have interrupted. Uh, no, no, I think that's really interesting. I mean, because it was, it was in a very strong sense that, you know, the people's um, memorial. I mean, if it hadn't been for that um, sort of upsurge of support for it and all those flowers and all those wreaths and all those bundles of flowers, um, uh, Latchins well, wouldn't have been able to go to the government and say, please, can I make a permanent memorial? Um, there there, there was that. also letter writing campaigns to the newspapers and to your rep, uh, parliament, whatever. Yeah. Um, and this, this is a fascinating image. Uh, this um, is um, a slide only recently discovered. Um, uh, which shows the cenotaph, the temporary cenotaph, it must be, in construction um, in um, a, a workshop of Latchins's. Uh, and you can see um, just, the, you know, this is the very early stage and this is the first time I think that this slide is, I've ever seen this, this slide, it's extraordinary. And here is a rather bad photograph, um, a sort of coloured in photograph of the temporary um, cenotaph um, uh, in, in, in the summer of um, 1919. And you can see um, that it's, it's, it's surrounded by flowers, but the, 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 the number of flowers and sort of um, wreaths grew and grew as the days went past. And it became this already uh, instantly, a kind of iconic uh, uh, memorial. And, you know, when people went by in the bus, the men would take their hats off when they went past it, just as they would take their hats off when they went into church. Um, so it has a sort of instant, an instant extraordinary ability to reflect how people felt. 
Um, and this is the um, day when the Senate, this temporary cenotaph, when the when, when the march took place through London and the temporary cenotaph um, was uh, unveiled. And you can see it's all rather chaotic, lots of people um, marching, but not in any great sort of um, order. Nothing has been rehearsed or choreographed. You look at the sign on the right saying, keep moving. Um, <laughs> it was just a huge heaving and rather spontaneous demonstration um, of um, you know, relief and joy and also mourning. Um, uh, after the end of the war. Um, this is an interesting photograph. On the right, we have Lachians here with his round glasses uh, and also with always a, a, a white collar and a tie like that. It's summer, so he's and so clearly this is the temporary cenotaph in July 1919. But what's interesting um, about um, this um, uh, photograph is that Lachians is walking away um, and he felt uh, that he hadn't really been given the recognition by the authorities that he deserved and that he hadn't been part of the march past um, the of the temporary cenotaph which inaugurated it after it, after it was unveiled. Um, but I think it's rather a striking image. Um, now, um, Lachin's, uh, you, you know, following on from this great sort of surge of popular support for the temporary cenotaph suggests to the government that they should um, allow him to make a permanent design in stone. Um, and um, these are some of the designs uh, for uh, the early um, uh, cenotaph. And you can see what, what, what is fascinating about this. I know Clive's going to talk about it too, but what is completely fascinating about it um, is that um, the, the sort of the, the geometry. Uh, and you might think just looking at the cenotaph um, as it stands proudly in Whitehall today, you might think that it's composed of um, square blocks of masonry. But in fact, uh, there is not a single line um, on the cenotaph that is completely straight or perpendicular. Um, and as you can see in the middle of these slides, um, it says lines to meet at approximately a thousand feet above the ground. Um, so all vertical lines on the cenotaph are supposed to meet way above the ground. I mean, the angle is really, I, 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 I don't have the geometry to work it out, but the angle um, of um, each of these um, vertical lines is really almost imperceptible to the naked eye. And then at the same time, the horizontals um, are all to meet 900 feet below the ground. So they're all parts of the radius of this great sphere, which is 900 feet below ground. And that is the same figure as Latchian's worked out uh, for the Great War Stone, 900 uh, part, segments of a circle with 900 feet um, below the ground. So this extraordinary complex geometry. Somebody said to Latchian's, why, why are you doing this? One of the ministers said, why are you, you know, why putting all of this geometry into such a complex, um, making it such a complex piece of work? And Latchian's replied um, that um, he did it um, in order to make the monument um, sculpturesque, in order to make it sort of move, in order to make it to give it a sort of dynamism, uh, which it wouldn't have um, if it was just slabs of Portland stone. Um, Ty, did you want we come in here? Oh, yeah, yes. Oh well, I was just. Uh, I think the only um, uh, you, uh, Jane explained it so well, but um, the only thing I would add is that um, it seems rem remarkable to me that his when he had to make this um, very, very grave and important memorial, his imagination immediately turned to mathematics. And uh, that's sort of doubly surprising because um, when he was growing up, he was, he was rather ill as a young boy. Uh, I think he had rheumatism or something like that. And he couldn't, he couldn't go to school um, in the way that his um, people of his age would normally have done. So he didn't really have that um, education in mathematics that you would normally have picked up at school, you know, so where did he get it? It must have been something very innate. But I think he also um, related very much to Christopher Wren, who is his great hero. And uh, of course, Christopher Wren was himself a mathematician um, as much as an architect. Um, these two slides, uh, uh, and thank you to Marcus for having um, provided them. Uh, down here, if I can just show you, that's, that's the scale of the 
cenotaph, which is tiny behind something to give the um, scale of this line, which is going to meet a thousand feet above the ground. But it gives a very, um, barely perceptible. In fact, to be quite honest, when I see it, I, I, I don't recognize it with my eyes, but um, possibly also because the stone has weathered because of the terrible air there used to be in London to, until the Second World War, which um, weathered everything. But uh, it gives a very, very slight false perspective to make the monument look taller, as though it's receding away from you. And this is um, this circle or sphere that he imagined, which was going to be an optical correction for the top of the cenotaph, for the, um, not the flat top, but actually it's slightly cushioned the, the top, so that it sort of looks flat, but it certainly doesn't look as though it's collapsing. Well, you know, it, it clearly, <clears throat> clearly was important to Lechens. It, we know that he had 33 pages of calculations that he worked through, and, and then they did actual scale templates so that the masons could carve the stone to the exact uh, degree that he, that he wanted it. It's, it's the genius of, of Lutyens that he's taking classical architecture and reinterpreting it and reinventing it. Here he's drawing on principles that go back to the ancient Greeks and their optical uh, optical refinement. So it's a. I, th I think he thought. I think he thought of it in terms. I mean, that's absolutely. I, I totally agree with that. I think mm -hmm. he thought of it in terms of being a universal language as well. Yes. And, and completely, um, uh, you know, well, secular and, and non-denominational yes. and, you know, coming back to the point of something that, that Clive made earlier about, um, it, he didn't want a, and he had to fight his battles, um, he didn't want um, a Christian uh, memorial, um, but there was a great deal of resistance when he was making the, you know, the permanent um, memorial. Um, there were a lot of people from a lot of church bishops and 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 um, leaders of the Church of England um, who pressed, uh, wrote letters to the Times and pressed him uh, to um, uh, you know produce something more Christian than <laughs> than a piece of abstract geometry. But Latchins uh, was determined and stuck to his guns. Um, so here we have um, this is. Um, uh, th this 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 photograph was taken a um, hundred years and one day um, ago um, uh, on the 11th of November um, uh, 1920, and that was the date um, of the um, uh, of the uh, of the unveiling of the permanent um, uh, cenotaph. Um, it's also um, you know the 11th of no 11 o'clock at 11th of November um, uh, 1918. That was the day. Um, that the war stopped. And it was also the day from at 11 o'clock um, on that day um, when there was a two minute silence that went all around the world. Um, uh, 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 and, um, uh, and everybody um, stopped what they were doing um, for two minutes. Um, and um, that, that, that was the origin of that tradition. I mean, I, I, was, I was out in London with my dog um, yesterday, which was the 11th of November, and I wasn't really thinking about the time. Uh, and suddenly at 11 o'clock, I was, in the, uh, I, 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 I was um, walking past a, a girls' school quite near here, and um, out onto the pavement came all the girls from the school, uh, and one of them um, started playing the last post on her violin. Then I went on to the station, to the train station, and there was a bugler playing the last, uh, playing the last post. Um, and um, again, um, two minutes silence. So um, that two minutes, uh, what, I think the point is that these sort of forms of ways of remembering, these sort of memorials that were, were developed around the end of the First World War in Britain, have had a sort of lasting um, um, influence that we still um, think in terms of a two minute silence, not just for war, but for, for other um, sad things. Um, and that also the cenotaph still remains um, the central, um, uh, the, the, the central to any kind of public grieving, any sort of, you know, commemoration. And of course, um, there is always um, the annual cenotaph um, service. So with this- Jane, we're starting to run out of time. What, sorry? We're running a little short on time. So. Oh, right, okay. Well, very quickly, um, just to, uh, so poppies. Uh, yes, we are. Um, uh, poppies, this, they, they come after latches. They're only really developed in, the 19, in 1926. Um, let's move on quickly past that. Uh, and here is, is a the- modern, A modern um, 
model. ceremony. Yeah. Perhaps we should. Um, and um, just coming back, just the last point that 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 1920 ceremony at the at the cenotaph, there is the unveiling of the cenotaph. There's a two minute silence, and then there's also a procession um, from Trafalgar down White Trafalgar Square down Whitehall, ending up in Westminster Abbey to the bringing the two the, the the coffin of the unknown warrior um, who is buried in Westminster Abbey. Um, in 1920. And, and all these uh, ceremonies were invented, you know, in a what now seems to be a very ad hoc kind of way, and yet they managed to uh, be such that people have continued them, as Jane was just saying, to this day. Um, but they were all almost cobbled together at the last minute because people have been thinking about so many other things. Um, that, that's... Okay, yeah, this, is, this, is, this is last weekend, isn't it? Yeah. I mean... Uh, and here is the Queen's grandfather, George V, uh, at, the, at, the, at the burial of the unknown warrior um, on that day in 11th of November 1920. So the continuity of these traditions is also um, extraordinary. But um, I think um, we would say that the central part um, of um, this sort of public grieving was the cenotaph. And I think perhaps we should leave it there, see if there's questions. Right, thank you very much indeed, um, Jane and Clive. That was um, a great exposition. By the way, it, there have been a couple of chats and it, it was on the tip of my tongue to, to say something. The, um, the Cross of Sacrifice, by the way, was by, designed by Reginald Longfield and not by Herbert Baker. <laughs>